Okay, well this will be the final video that I do uh, on the Book of Genesis, at least for the time being. Maybe next year I will return and continue on from the 12th chapter. But uh, the first batch of videos I wanted to focus really on the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And uh, many thanks to those of you that have started with me and have finished with me. Just a quick point I wanted to highlight before I get to the 11th chapter. Uh, chapter 4, a man called Lamech is mentioned and uh, he's a great great grandson of Cain and of course he's in that cursed line which the Antichrist I believe will come from but uh, Lamech like his great great grandfather wasn't only a murderer uh, but he was also the first polygamist in scripture and he's also the father of music and uh, if you go through Ezekiel you'll find that Satan is also linked with music. Uh, just a point I wanted to share with you. I think uh, everything in Scripture is written for a purpose and for a reason, and uh, it's down to all Christians to be faithful Bereans, studying the Scriptures, searching the Scriptures, and uh, using it as a shield and also for our own edification. The 11th chapter has got uh, a couple of genealogies in it, dealing with Shem, and I won't read them all, I haven't got time to. So like the 10th chapter, I'll just pick out the verses which I think are the most important, and uh, invite you, the listener, to read the entire chapter at your own leisure. Verse 1, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. If you go to the book of uh, Zephaniah, chapter 3 verse 9 and the scripture says for then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent this is eschatological no doubt about it and uh, this verse tied in with the 11th chapter suggests to me that somehow in the tribulation or late tribulation the people of the earth are going to have one language now I can't really expound any more on that uh, but uh, these verses can be cross-referenced uh, to get a perhaps a bigger or a more clearer picture. But uh, when I read this earlier on, I thought Zephaniah 3.9, uh, also from the 10th chapter, needed to be uh, cross-referenced and put to you too. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shina, and they dwelt there. New Testament the wise men came from the east. It's quite unusual for those in the east to travel to the west or anywhere really because in antiquity the east was where all the knowledge was. And uh, you can imagine Herod being in Jerusalem and this massive army uh, arriving, going around everywhere, asking everybody where the king of the Jews was born. And uh, I just want to say one quick point that of all the biblical films that I've ever watched, nearly all of them, admit the fact that the wise men wouldn't have traveled on their own they would have had a big army possibly a few hundred men they were carrying gold frankincense and myrrh plus other valuables so they are like modern day ambassadors if you will and modern day ambassadors living in dangerous countries travel uh, in a large security detail but uh, here it says that uh, they traveled from the east three and they said one to another go to let us make brick and burn them thoroughly and they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar and they said go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth nobody can be too dogmatic about the exact timing of the pyramids when they were built and uh, it's possible that these early builders were trying to either mimic the pyramids or the Egyptians were trying to mirror what these guys are doing but either way it's going to be in vain and Jesus said in John 10 that uh, thieves and robbers came before him and he was the only way to be saved so when you have people coming together trying to reach deity however they would envisage it if it's not done in light of scripture, then it's vain, totally vain. 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. 
capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's Jehovah God. And verse 7 tells me that is the triune God, a reference to the Trinity. 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Again, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit built the earth from nothing. I've shown you that from the first chapter. They resurrected the Lord Jesus Christ together. But here, the triune God are literally on the earth, monitoring what's happening, and they're going to deal with this rebellion, this high treason as the Lord sees it. 8. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build this city. One of the commandments was to go forth, multiply, and populate the earth. Book of Acts tells us that the Lord sent the apostles out to preach the gospel, and one of the ways that he was able to get his apostles to spread out was persecution. The Roman emperors didn't want the Jews in Rome, so they expelled them. That forced them out. Pressure from Israel also pushed them out. And here the Lord himself has said, I don't want you to stay here, I want you to go out. There's a whole world out there. And uh, they were all hanging around Mesopotamia. And the Lord said, no, you're going to spread out. And eventually the twelve tribes of Israel are going to take the world. Nine, therefore, is the name of it called Babel. Because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. The subject of speaking in tongues comes to mind when I look at the 11th chapter. Acts 2 tells us that when the apostles spoke in tongues, their own brethren that were there noted the language that was being spoken, many different languages of course, and they were spoken in their own tongues. Paul says in 1 Corinthians that if somebody speaks in tongues, there must be an interpreter. The interpreter is there to explain to the congregation what is being said. And if somebody goes into your meeting and everyone's speaking in tongues and there's no interpreter, then it's like a madhouse. Tongues were for a sign to the Jews and they were given to the saved Jews as a rebuke to the unsaved Jews, whereas prophecy edifies the entire church. Today's tongues are predominantly gibberish and mean nothing whatsoever. Uh, there's also a danger that uh, you fall into the demonic realm when you start blabbering in tongues. But if you are into tongues, if you think tongues are still applicable, then Acts 2 tells you that they are a known language. And 1 Corinthians makes it very clear that only two or three men would speak in tongues any one time, always with an interpreter present. Never women. Women don't speak in tongues, nor do they interpret. They can pray, they can prophesy according to the 11th chapter, but they don't speak in tongues. Tongues was given to men in the New Testament to proclaim the gospel, and like I say, it was a sign to the Jewish people. But uh, today's modern tongue movement doesn't even modestly resemble what we find in the scripture. 10, 11, 12, 13, going right down to uh, 25, deals with the line of Shem, and again, Shem is a godly man. In fact, I've got a chart here, which I'm just going to quickly uh, read to you. Shem, Abraham, Lot, Rebekah, Isaac, and even Esau, of course, come uh, from that line as Shem. Jesus Christ also comes in that line. Esau is a bit of a difficult one because he gets involved with Edom, marries a Hittite, uh, an Ishmaelite, and of course Baal and Muhammad come from that line. So he starts out well, Esau, he's in the right line, shall we say. But uh, scripture says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And uh, the Muslims claim that uh, Muhammad is linked to Ishmael, which is clearly found in the scripture. And he's uh, also directly linked to Esau. So Shem, Abraham, Rebekah, Isaac and Esau come from Shem. But the curse line... One more time, this cursed line, uh, Ham, Nimrod, Babel, Nineveh, Philistine, Sodom and Gomorrah, and Dan. Again, Dan, a lot of people think, is the tribe which will produce the Antichrist in the last days.
26, and Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. They would be the brothers of uh, Abraham, of course. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. But uh, Abraham was Lot's uncle. And uh, some Catholics will use this to prove that uh, the brethren of the Lord spoken of in the Gospels are not his physical brethren, but uh, his cousins. But that won't work, because Genesis clearly tells you that uh, his brother produced Lot. And just because they're called brothers doesn't mean they were biological brothers. It's simply an expression. We have brothers in the Lord. We call this person brother such and such. He's not my literal brother. He's my spiritual brother. So just read the scriptures a bit more carefully and you won't make the same blunder. 28. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. Job also uh, comes from the city of Ur. And he too would be uh, a type of Christ. He's also a type of a suffering Jew in the tribulation. And he gets delivered, of course, at the end of Job. But uh, all these lines are linked up quite nicely. But you've got to study the scriptures to get them uh, in the right order. 29 talks about Abram and his brother taking wives. And, of course, Sarah becomes Sarah later on, which means princess. Uh, 30 says she was barren, had no child. 31 and Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran his son's son and Sari his daughter-in-law his son Abram's wife and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan and they came unto Haran and dwelt there and the days of Terah were two hundred and five years and Terah died in Haran and that concludes the eleventh chapter and uh, like I say I might return to this book in the new year but uh, my final point would be that as Christians, as Biblicists, we need to defend the creation account. We need to defend the integrity of the inspiration and the preservation of the scripture. We need to stand firm on faith through Christ alone, Jesus' deity, the triunity of God, and uh, his exclusivity. He is the only way that man is ever going to be saved. And I believe that every Bible-believing Christian in whatever way he or she has been gifted by the Lord, has a duty and is minded to defend the creation account, the scriptures, uh, Jesus' deity, and his exclusivity. You need to repent and come to the Son of God. And I think anything that uh, falls short of those particular areas is a travesty. We are ambassadors for Christ, and the battle lines, I suggest, have been drawn and I ask you, where do you stand on these issues?